I will go ahead and start uh, today's program, um, letting you know that we are broadcasting from both San Diego and Los Angeles, which are unceded lands of native people. Um, these include the Kumeyaay people of San Diego and the Tongva people whose ancestral home includes present day Los Angeles. The Kumeyaay and Tongva people still call Southern California home today, and I am personally grateful to share this land with them. Today, we welcome Paul Sapuya as our guest lecturer. Paul teaches photography at the University of California in San Diego and was previously a student of Catherine Opie, our keynote lecturer for 2021. Um, just as the pandemic was setting in, in April of last year specifically, Paul published um, a monograph of his work through the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis and Aperture. Uh, that, that monograph quickly sold out, so we will eagerly anticipate a second printing of it, uh, let's hope anyway. Um, Paul is an artist whose work has helped us reimagine portraiture. Um, his photographs humanize the act of photography and share a perspective from the queer black gaze that add an important layer to the larger history of photography. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome Paul today. Uh, and if your video is not off, I'll remind you to go ahead and turn that off now. And we will turn the stage over to Paul Sapuya. Thank you. Okay, hey. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, Scott. Um, hello, everyone out there in uh, medium photo land. Uh, let me see here. How do I? I'm looking at everyone else's grid. If I, I'm pinning myself, so at least hopefully you're seeing me. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, and we'll begin. I'm going to try to keep this to about 45 minutes. I tend to, I don't know how to make a short, a brief artist <laughs> lecture. I'm going to, so, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to generally go over things kind of chronologically. Um, but what I'm, I'm trying to do something a little bit different with this, with this talk and kind of um, structured around different sections or different topics. So I hope that there you'll be able to sort of like find and draw the connections through. And then I definitely welcome any comments and everything afterwards. Um, I'm hearing some other audio. I'm not sure where that's coming from. Um, if, any, if, if everybody could please make sure that you're mute. Um, yourself is muted and your video is turned off. That would be great. Yeah, I'm hearing like some buzzing and stuff like that. <laughs> okay, anyways, um, I, have I already said thank you? Thank you for having me. Um, I hope everyone is doing well. I'm coming to you from um, Los Angeles. Um, as Scott mentioned, I'm on faculty at um, UCSD, um, uh, an associate professor in media. I'm originally from San Bernardino. Um, I lived and worked in New York from 2000 to 2014 when I came back to um, Southern California to go to graduate school. So I'm actually gonna be showing work from prior, I'm kind of starting from about 2005 on, or 2004 onward. Okay, here we go. So here we're looking at an installation view of, from a two, 2019 exhibition called The Conditions. Um, I don't have too many installation views in here, but I think it's always really important when we're looking at photography to see the work, not just in these translations of JPEGs on the screen, but the, in terms of like scale and um, installation. So here's a section of uh, uh, one wall with four works. Each is a scale about 34 by 51 inches, at which, for example, subjects like this portrait of um, Anthony here is approximate sort of uh, two scale. I'm really interested in this relationship of scale in surface um, and uh, in the images, which we can get to more later. But I want to begin kind of with references. Um, 
there's a lot of sort of nested references and conversations going on in my work. Um, too many to cover, <laughs> but I just want to, I'm just going to go over a few things. So this is an image, it's actually a page that was from the Trigger catalog from this exhibition at the New Museum. Um, and they'd asked uh, the, the artists in the show to, to um, include images or text that kind of referenced um, the space of the studio, um, references, etc. And so this is just like a snapshot that was made on this chalk, uh, not chalkboard, but one of those push pin cork boards on my studio. You can kind of see all the things that are kind of going on in my head. Um, we have everything here from like, you know, a screen grab from an Annie Lennox music video to, you know, a Judy Dater photograph, like my own snapshots, like we have Alice Neal. Um, you know, there's all these, there's kind of like all of these things, like links um, together kind of simultaneously. Overlaid on this, is um, something that I actually used to use for artist talks, which is a, a text that I've kind of gathered over the years. It's about a, about a 25 page document of notes, um, of, uh, of quotation, citation. And so quotation and citation and things like that, this type of layering um, have always been a big part of, of my work. Um, you kind of see that translated into a work like this from 2018, Studio Wall, which itself is a photograph um, of, as it is, my studio wall in Los Angeles, where we see elements of my own images. These fragments come from just like iPhone snapshots that I gather at night. This is a sliver of a self-portrait. We see my hand here. This is a vernacular. Um, image that was included in, a, in an exhibition at the ICP in New York of black vernacular photography. We have, we see, um, this is a screen grab of um, Fassbender's Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant, really interested in sort of this, the, the, the stage, the scene in which things play out. We see, you know, I'm, I'm pulling Matisse, uh, Matisse's uh, uh, Pink Studio, Bouguereau's Water Girl, some 90s, um, some 90s, just like porno, all kinds of things. Anyways, there's a lot always kind of going on in my work. And I like to kind of mention those fragments because oftentimes if this current work um, conversation comes up about abstraction or concealing or fragmentation, and I'm always really interested in the fact that um, at, at, uh, all fragments point back to a source that is whole. Another thing that I'm really interested in is this is this double language play of the photographer of the of the darkroom? So here we have an uh, image of a photographer's darkroom. I'm assuming we're all photographers here, so I'm not going to talk about that. Like, you know, going to sort of like overly explain it, but I want to hold on to this idea for those of you who be, who whose introduction was to photography through the black and white analog. Um, that sense of an initial encounter or learning to, to see and um, evaluate an image or a type of uh, 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 first encounter with an, with an image or an object within the conditions of the darkroom, um, having to anticipate how that will be translated into a shared public viewing space. Um, I hope that kind of makes sense. Because then I'm also thinking about the dark room of the space, whether it's the more sort of elaborate built out thing like this Brighton sauna, or simply the dark room, which is the space at the, the, at the back end of the bar that is designated for, um, for um, as a queer social and sexual kind of like space of encounter. But this way in which the dark room in both, or particularly like in the queer social space, is a place where a lot of material is generated that then at some point gets translated into what would, we would call the light. Um, I'm really interested in this visual, but also I think conceptual overlay with like Richard Bruce Nugent's work. This is a, uh, uh, one issue, I guess we would call it Zine, published in 26. I guess I'm saying 1926, because that's almost 100 years ago now. I love this, this, uh, the, the, this modernist um, 
image here, right? This kind of like a, a, a double negative thing that's happening. Um, Bruce Nugent, who's, this is a portrait of him by Carl Van Vechten, which itself is a very complicated relationship to photography, patronage, etc. published the first um, acknowledged writing by a, um, we'd now say queer Black American writer during the Harlem Renaissance. It was published 10 years prior to this portrait, but his work has remained sort of like a, a, a way for me of understanding a subject's relation to the generation of portraiture. Because in that work of his, he's uh, his own first person perspective sort of subject in this story called Lily Smoke and Jade is guided by the recognition of subjects of relationships of his negotiation of attraction and, and love looking outwards. I'm also always thinking about, I'm always coming back to Virginia Woolf um, and Orlando, um, which is a whole deep topic, but I just want to point to these images that were made with her sister, Vanessa Bell, um, that in this way in which the making of a portrait kind of became this, um, uh, this way of involving the subject, Vita Sackville West, um, in this sort of like translation through this, image portrait making process that kind of sits in between this negotiation of just like how the text works as a biography not biography virginia wolf's a whole other thing <laughs> i'm kind of so one of the reasons why i'm like pulling from things that are from like uh you know now we would say like why am i looking at work from the early 20th century right like someone like uh truman capote here like something i'm really interested in is in the ways in which all of these artists understood the way in which portraiture is a form of currency it's a form of communication and for example capote really understanding how the generation of it and the dissemination of it into the world um was uh was was uh i don't know it was just a, a vast field and I come to that because you'll see, I'm going to show a little bit later, um, negotiating how portraits went into the world of kind of a emerging, I guess, so to speak, social media, the, you know, the, the, the emergence of, uh, you know, platforms like MySpace and Facebook, et cetera, became a really complicated space to be making queer portraiture in. So anyways, Truman Capote had everything that like Instagram people, do now where they load up images before any content actually arrives. Capote had it figured out in, 19, in the 1940s. I'm also thinking about this, you know, a particular image like this by Jean Weisinger, which is made in collaboration with Alice Walker, in the way in which, particularly for queer people, we, we make images of others in order to, to be able to sort of see something mirrored in ourselves, to be able to like articulate and kind of like make real things that might not otherwise have been seen or um, validated. And Weisinger really, I think in a beautiful way, sums up as she set out to make this project photographing other um, uh, lesbian and bisexual women in the 70s that when she approached Alice Walker, Alice said, oh, I'm gonna take a picture of you. And so, we don't think of Ellis Walker as a photographer. We don't think of her role in that way, but how it sets, how that act sets up um, and really validates Jean Weisinger's practice. I think it's a really beautiful thing. Um, I'm gonna go through a couple more things. Carl Van Vechten's a whole, <laughs> he's a complicated person, but I'm just gonna throw out this image of Archie Savage, a dancer, um, and thinking about the ways in which photographers have also used the constructions of a set of tableau as as a stage in one way in order of course to make a portrait right but the 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 space the photographer creates often in itself becomes a place of really complicated and messy and um just just the whole mess of uh negotiating uh crisscross desire and all these things plat lines i'm gonna go over this real quick Plat lines. Okay, Rotimi Fanicchioti, I love him in the way in which this work really responds to Mabel Thorpe, who it's like, 
how do we get past Maplethorpe? Like, I feel like he just exploited everything from the language of like what black and white photography is and just pulling it into its most grotesque kind of like outcome. But, uh, you know, a simple act of, uh, but really powerful act of Fanny Coyotes here, who, you know, is a contemporary who now is getting a lot the attention that he deserves, but, you know, really suffers in the shadow of someone like Maplethorpe. Um, just, you know, kind of reclaiming all of those things that um, Maplethorpe puts under his control and literally like aiming the camera at the crotch right back out. Um, and another thing I'm really interested in art making is its complicated relationship to disclosure of information. Um, and so like, okay, a painter or whatever, but like, so Larry Rivers, was someone who I think in a similar way to Truman Capote um, and Virginia Woolf understood that the medium and the work itself, while being composed or engaged with certain, you know, interests in the field or the medium or whatever, also has this dual role of disclosing. And this work, Larry Rivers, the studio from 56, is really interesting in the way in which it coincides with these series of works around his quite public relationship with Frank O'Hara culminates in the, the portrait of uh, O'Hara in Boots, while O'Hara is navigating this public role as curator um, at MoMA, as well as a poet in his own right. So there's something like interesting in the way in which, you know, improper, so, you know, art provides this way that discloses information that proper society, social norms doesn't necessarily allow. And I have to like always come back to the importance of something that I've learned from Lyle Ashton Harris that within an artist's career and within your practice, all everything within your grasp, everything that you may have done and put out into the world can always come back to you and be reincorporated and you can always continue to build meaning on it. Um, I really love his installations like these where he's able to generate new work by still going out there, you know, and continuing to engage in the world, but pulling back um, images of his that may have already had lives in institutions or in publication and continue to build on them. Um, I just love this stuff. Um, and so I'm going to jump to like, this is like a screen grab from, I think this was like V Magazine in 2005. 2006, just kind of giving a context of like this queer zine world thing that was happening. So for, you know, for the first many years of, of making work, like my work kind of was very much limited to this space, um, which was like, oh my God, if I think about how many of the publications listed here that I was also involved in, um, I think it actually, probably every single one of them um, at some point. But this is what I was talking about when I'm, when at a certain point I had to look to, I had, I had to find and kind of like think about how Capote navigated things because the work, something happened, I mean, how do I say it? <laughs> There's a way in which images may move faster than our ability to understand them. Years later, in 2013, during a year when I had like total studio block, I started going through and going back years and years and years of where my images had started recirculating on um, sites like Tumblr, et cetera. I've actually, I never really show this work in artist talks, but I think this would be really, I was just kind of interested in throwing this out there. But, I think they speak to this way in which um, uh, things, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> Everything travels, right? Um, it was really funny because like, I remember once my mom being like, I, cert I, I Google had just come out. She's like, I Googled you and I found your work in all these really interesting places. There's this interesting art blogs and then some things are just pornographic. And I was like, well, okay. <laughs> so, anyways, here are some recent portraits. Um, I'm showing these because 
the current work that tends to be um, seen has been um, the more kind of like complicated studio kind of like fragmentation, all these things. But like I said before, it's really important for me that acknowledging that all of the types of fragmentation, all of the content, everything that might be um, made and remade, all comes back to the fact that like portraits are still the core of my practice, so to speak, which is really important because one thing that I wanted to do was always kind of acknowledge the reason why I picked up the camera, which was, I think many people have is, you know, when I first started making photographs, I had this idea that, that, you know, when you know how to work a camera technically, precisely, it gives you this result that can, that reassures us, you know, I picked up my camera and I started making photographs of friends, of, uh, you know, my, my early group of friends in New York post undergrad, my family, my extended family in Louisiana, um, as a way to get to know people or understand my relationships to people. And so the family portraits turned into something else, which um, at some point I'm, I want to kind of like expand on, on that. Those works actually turned into landscape work. But the portrait work that really kind of started in, you know, just in my kitchen and in my bedroom in Brooklyn, trying to make sense of like these, my first kind of like mostly queer friend group was, I, I quickly realized in attempting to define my relationships and friendships with these people, the ways in which images traveled produced a lot of complications, the types of complications that I alluded to earlier, which were, I, it took me years to figure out what to do with those. Um, I should also say it's always been really important that the subjects of my work are people that I know, they're people, they're, her, they're friends. And I think I have a few works here where I wanna kind of like show the, 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 the time that kind of is involved in these. Um, so you'll see, you know, I, You'll see, like, for example, this portrait here of Katie, you know, by 2011, this is probably the third series of portraits I've made with her. Um, and, um, you know, she reappears here in 2017, this work in 2017. Um, uh, and so the, my work has changed over the years, but I'm really interested in this, in, in the ways in which there is a type of continuity with a lot of the subjects and friends and it's um yeah so here this portrait of victor from 2010 um we find in this work that was in the show at Vilmetter, los angeles last year he reappears in this in this project a conversation around pictures okay so oh, let's see how am i doing on time i think i'm doing pretty good <laughs> okay so outtakes um I was thinking I want to talk about outtakes because I'm not the type of artist who maps out ideas and then executes them. It's always this process of just like, I'm drawn to keeping the make, making work and it, it's the process of revisiting things that are outtakes, things that are things made in boredom, things that are that just kind of like linger with me because I don't know what they are at the time. My process of, it's always through the process of, um, of editing, which is through selecting, not like post-production, but like editing as in like laying things out where meaning gets made. I guess I should go back and say like an image like this comes from a series of zines I made. So also using very accessible and affordable means of, of producing things was always really important, especially as a young artist in New York. I made those zines using my uh, the copy machine at my office. I worked at Creative Capital Foundation in the Warhol Foundation offices. When they asked me to make photocopies for work, I'd sneak in my own zines. <laughs> I think they found out at some point. But anyways, it was, it was some, there's something that like always lingered with me in that. And so what you're looking at here is an installation view of a project called Studio Work, which is really, you know, so I had this residency. It was the first like big residency I had. And I didn't know what on earth I was doing. 
But I realized somewhere along the line that the work itself was all of the outtakes. It was all of my test prints. It was the books I was reading. It was the, you know, laser prints and notes and stuff. And so the exhibition, the work itself became all of that material, const, you know, reopened, revisited, relooked at in each instance that I could present it. But that way of like always like looking for those, um, those, they're not completely accidents because they're the, the condition, the, the, the conditions that need to be set up are a type of close looking, but I'm interested in that type of thing that happens. So this is where collage enters into the work. In a piece like this, desktop April 2nd, 2014, for years I made just snapshots that was just for me to keep track of my own memory with works. It actually began in the analog darkroom, um, both black and white in color, always just keeping notes of things that were next to each other. Because I found that when I selected an image to be discreetly and individually, you know, you get that one thing you get to put in a group show somewhere or like reproduce. I was always holding on to everything that existed in my studio at the same time, or I guess my studio, it, to be honest, was my coffee table or kitchen table or just the dark room I was renting for that afternoon. And so what that helped me to do is in these years between 2011 and 2014, when I didn't have a studio, my studio became, became um, how do I say, returning to this process of like quickly and easily producing images, which is through Xeroxing, going to FedEx, Kinko's, um, eventually getting a laser printer that I just kept under my bed in Brooklyn, printing things out and whatever I could fit in my tote bag or whatever I could bind or clip together was the work, was my studio. An image like this is at a moment, my friend Brendan Fernandez was out of, was on a residency and so I used his studio in our neighborhood for a month. And I would, at times like this, unfurl these bundles of paper and I could, re and I could make photographs of them that in a sense would be working through of what was happening. Um, uh, they were organized contemporaneously, but they might pull from a longer stretch of, of time. So for example, this is a, a bundle of works made from images made in the studios or looking at the work of various artists. We have um, every, from, you know, this, this points to AK Burns, this here we have Malik Gaines and Alexandra Sagade. Here we have LA-based artist Amir Nikrivan. There's, and I'll get to this later, but it's been really also a big part of the work that a lot of the subjects of the work are fellow artists. But this leads into these books. And this is a lot of stuff that I, I don't think many people have seen, but I think it's really important to show all of this because this is everything that I brought that led up to the mirror-based compositions that everyone knows, is more familiar with now. So in the summer of 2013, after a couple of years of not knowing what on earth I was doing, carrying around tote bags of printouts and stuff, I had a, res I had a residency at Fire Island, Fire Island Artist Residency, where I worked with, you know, some amazing, some amazing folks. And um, I found a way of pulling all of this, these several years of material together. And I put it together in this first, it's the first volume of this, it's bound. How do I say? I, I, I began working with a book binder in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Um, the press is called Small Edition. It was started by um, a woman named Corinna and it's now run by a woman named Hannah. And I began sending off these, these bundles of material and they would, they would custom bind them for me. And they became in a sense like a repository, like, like, a, like my own primary source material from which all of the work that's from then on to now is still found, there's still a place found for it, all that material within these books. Here we see an installation view. That was in a group show. We see a couple of the books and then other material that had yet to be bound together. And this project is called Some Recent Pictures and it's ongoing. Um, and so how it gets to the mirror, reflecting in the mirror, 
is had all to do with coming back to Los Angeles. And so I think like anyone who's ever made an abrupt move, you know how much baggage you carry with you, not only just like the things like the clothes and your books or whatever, but like baggage. And for me, it was a lot of this still yet to be unresolved material. And so the mirror for me came in as a way, and you can actually see here, this is a picture taken during a crit in grad school. Um, I began going to Home Depot, the Home Depot in um, Ladera Heights. Um, and I, I would make like trips down there and just getting these mirrors and I just put them in the back of my, um, in the back of my old Ford Fusion, the biggest ones I could find. And so I think maybe you can make it out here, like it has papers in front of it. But so this is the scale of the mirror that I was making these works on, which they became a surface onto which I could arrange this yet to be resolved material in a composition. Um, but it was important for me that in the process, I was always reflected in it that I was, you know, sometimes people would ask, how come I just didn't make it easier by just doing this digitally? But it's always been really important for me to work with like material, physical material. Um, um, not like a layer that I could turn on and off in Photoshop or something, and that I was necessarily reflected in them. Um, and so in some of them, I do remain. In these images, I actually, um, uh, I've set the camera on a timer and I've walked away. So in all of these pictures, what you're seeing is the, the camera that you see, this is a, by Mamiya 67 RZ, um, is the picture, is the camera that's making the picture that you see. This is material that's on the surface of the mirror. These are pages. This is the wall back in the studio. Okay, so I'm going to go kind of quickly through these collage photos um, in the interest of time because I want to get to some of the more recent stuff. But you start to see what happens. Like eventually, I realized the type of fragmentation that was occurring strictly because of. I was using these pages that were meant to be, that just print out, that are meant to be bound into books. I wanted a different type of fragmentation, one that was more accountable to a gesture of mine rather than just industrial pa printer paper is this size and the printer is this size, right? So I began cutting, tearing, and otherwise like, you know, fragmenting in, in different ways. And we see it play out in this work that began post-grad school. Um, and, or actually no, that, that began um, in my works in, from my thesis show. So images like this were in my UCLA thesis, um, where you still see a bit of this, still kind of pulling from some of that content, but we get to other works, you know, where it's, it becomes uh, very different. We're gonna go through these. I think they're lovely, but I don't really have that much to say about them. Um, because some of the content in them, like I will talk about these smudges, um, I'll talk about that later. Oh, this work. So these are, you know, the, it's an ongoing series. I think they're really interesting. Like formally, um, I think they're really, there's still a lot for me to do with them. Um, but the mo many of the ideas I'm thinking through right now are in other projects. Um, but it's interesting, like these mirror studies serve a similar purpose as the books, as they kind of become a holding place for me to work through um, additional material. And I do love making a pretty picture. Um, I'll, you know, always admit to that. Um, so one thing that happened is this coming back again to the beginning, I was mentioning the dark room was thinking of through the darkroom mirror. So something, there, this came about from the convergence of several things. One of them, or maybe it's convergence of three or four things. I'll just name them and then we'll come up with a number later. One is the making images using the, the construction of a backdrop or a set. And I became really interested in um, how the making of the backdrop because i was using all these props that just were i was really wanting to just use the types of props that are an element of the language of the photo studio right and it's like okay the, the construction of a, of a backdrop designates a space that is meant to be seen and then by extension creates a space that is not meant to be seen by accident or by disregard or by whatever and i became really interested in the moving of bodies into that space 
but some of it also came from this thing that I that I was really wanting to kind of play up, which is as I started making work that was fra that contained fragments, um, I noticed as far back as you know, even prior to grad school, any sliver of any black body became a self portrait, and I was and so I just started sneaking in photographs of other black friends and we would just sort of play this game of like and i would let a lot of them become self-portraits but they may not be so i'm really actually interested in the construction of a scene in this space behind the curtain in front of a mirror that the, that the viewer cannot see the viewer of the image cannot see but it is made for these two subjects here we don't know we you know it's it's not definitive if there are two subjects we do not know if i am one of the subjects or not um, so I was kind of really into that, um, thinking about black, this, these black and, and at, at times I was using these brown, dark brown velvets as a material that I could kind of like move into and out of, merge into, interested in the idea of like the manipulation of it, or, um, you know, also that the hand that, that kind of controls the backdrop is the hand that more so than the camera, it's the hand that um, that allows, that negotiates the permission of what can be seen or not. So I wanna talk about this picture, but I think I've gotta go, well, actually, I'm gonna have to come, I think I have to go a little bit further before I get to something about this image. So one thing I have to say about this and how the darkroom really came together is that as far back as, I'm gonna go back to here, to these images, these mirror surfaces are covered with smudges and fingerprints and the traces of me. And if I was making portraits of other people, it's all on the surfaces of these. Now, I stopped cleaning the surface of these mirrors because I didn't want them to disappear into like non-space. Um, and I didn't want them to disappear into like, being, you know, a tool to make like a tricky picture or for it to look digital in any way. And so, you know, this is made several years after these ideas have come together. But if I go ahead to here, this is the image that was the first attempt to actually photograph the smudges in the mirror. Because what I realized is against the white walls of the studio and against, in a, you know, the white, how many times do we talk about the white walls of the studio and, and crits and stuff like that, right? It literally, it just like obliterates the information, all the trace on the surface of the mirror, which I became, started to become more and more interested in because it, it was the thing that like held a type of latent information um, in the way that like undeveloped or, un, or unprocessed film does before it is, goes through the, you know, the processing, right? Um, and that, those traces only started to become visible when I would catch the reflection of something black. It would, it would often be the camera tripod apparatus or like my own body. So I began constructing a dark cloth around and a dark room around the mirror and putting my camera inside. This was an attempt to photograph the surface of the mirror. You start to see it here. I hope it, I'm not sure how well this translates to viewing on Zoom. But this is what leads to these images where I'm just fully stepping inside that space um, and really just kind of like seeing what happens there. Um, and for a while I was making these, you know, just sort of by myself and just playing with, you know, like this or that one I showed before, if I go back, you know, sometimes they were in the darkroom, sometimes they were images like this. But then one day, sorry, doing all this jumping around, um, a friend of mine was back in town and he wasn't, he was like, he came by for a studio visit. He was like, I don't understand how you're making these. Or he wanted it, me to show him how I was making them. And I was like, oh, this is how we do it. And, and then he was like, I want to be in one. And I was like, no, I'm, they're just, it's just me. I'm just in them. So then we, we like tried some things out and then this portrait with Evan worked out and this really, it opened up this whole other things. It's, it's a very simple image. He's pulling back the curtain. So he's sort of like on the outside of this space. I'm on the, I'm sort of on the inside, but it was this picture that opened up the, this idea of the fun in the, in the overlay of the language of the darkroom, the darkroom to which 
you're thinking about like com using the comp the composition elements and the formal elements of the images playing off just like the, the fluidity of the queer darkroom space, um, but using it to think through all of these ideas of like here we have, you know, multiple, mul I would say this is an image of multiple uh, hues of black in a single, in a single image. Um, and just these like really kind of like playful ways. Um, but nodding, taking a nod back to this idea of, um, you know, thinking through that most of these, the subjects in my work, because their friends are also other artists, I began asking, inviting friends to make images alongside me in these, in these uh, studio darkroom spaces. And so this led to a series of darkroom mirror portraits where, um, you know, like Giancarlo here and Dicko here are also making photographs. We're kind of like making photographs together in this space that I've constructed. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's kind of like an ongoing thing, but it led, you know, this isn't a double, um, there's only a single camera here, but um, sorry, that's a, out of order. But it leads to this like question that kind of came up because, you know, even in the images prior to this, it's been really important to me since the very first portraits I made back in 2005, which was the point at which I, I, I was like, the pictures I'm making are not just photographs of people, but there needs to be a mutual entanglement and mutual investment for, for me to feel like they're portraits. So all along me making pictures of other people, it's been really important for me to sit for um, um, as a subject in, in these exchanges. And so, you know, this is a portrait of Nahir making a photograph of me. Um, this goes back to, you know, there's works like this, where even prior to the introduction of a second camera, I was, there's a whole series of works that I've never shown in an artist talk that are me making photographs in the places where um, painters are making portraits. And so even prior to the like reflection in the mirror, you, I, I was really interested in this triptych the production of a portrait of Keaton here by this painter, New York-based artist, T.M. Davey, but the inclusion of my reflection here, which points to my kind of involvement in this whole kind of like circuit of, of looking and production. But when it came to showing this work, this image, Dark Room Mirror, 210135, in a show in 2018, there was a review of the show, which I was, we're all thrilled to have reviews of our shows, but the writer described my friend James here as a, um, a model slash assistant setting up my camera. And I was like, that's a really interesting, that's a bold interpretation. Like it's one thing, I mean, it's one thing to interpret what one sees in an image, but factually there are two cameras happening. James is operating his Roloflex. It is on a tripod. He is setting up his camera and we see my camera held up to my face, which is the camera that's making the image. And I was like, okay, so many things are happening here. Like, I was like thinking, okay, back to these images, are people thinking that everything is just staging? Like, what's going on here? There are a lot, there's a lot of images made alongside these and they may or may not look anything like my own. So I was like really holding on to this and I wrote back a correct, I wanted to start a conversation by doing a letter to the editor, but they just corrected it. And I was like, damn, that was a missed opportunity to talk about a lot of things. So I'm really interested in like this, in, this entanglement in the making of images, um, questions of authorship and also agency. So, you know, I was making a lot of pictures like this along the way. And it, what it ended up leading to was, you know, for a couple of years I was holding, I was sort of, you know, asking friends who I made pictures with to hold on to them in the hopes that maybe one day we could make a group show of all of this work. And it ended up being presented um, in the context of the Whitney Biennial. And that was a really complicated experience because, you know, to be in a group show with that, with that amount of notoriety, it, you know, there really is like this 
attempt at a clear cut line of who was in the biennial and who was not. Like my name is list, was listed as like the official artist. But what it really was, was there was one picture of mine, two collaborative pictures and photographs by 10 friends whose work was in the show at various stages of either co-authorship and, and for example, this work made with A.L. Steiner or work where I am not the author, but I'm the subject. This image is by James Garcia, which is corresponds to, to the session where this image was made. We have the images made with Clay Kerrigan and Ariel Goldberg. We have images made with Giancarlo, um, uh, Sant uh, Giancarlo Santangelo. We have um, other, we have Derek Woods Morrow, Diego Chan, we have um, Emerson Ricard, and we have Peter Tomka as well. And so it was interesting because I, you know, there's people that I'd known for a long time. Um, and I would run into them afterwards and they'd be like, great show. And they would talk about like, oh, you made all these different kinds of pictures. And I'd have to say, these are not my pictures. <laughs> These are, I'm really interested in bringing something else into that space. So it's a question not yet resolved, but I just wanted to kind of put that out there. But it leads to this, the last two things I want to kind of talk about, which is, is like the title of conversation around pictures was my last, the title of my last show, which was my first show here at, uh, in Los Angeles at uh, Vilmetter Projects. It opened the day that the, a year ago exactly was the install day. We were installing and it was canceled. The opening was supposed to be on the 14th, which is, I think, I remember we were like, we got the stay at home orders and we were like, well, no opening. But anyways, several things kind of came together. Everyone has cell, phone, cell phones. And I had an image like this model study with my friend Yasser was like an outtake. Um, I never knew what to do with like this and other pictures where like, as I was sort of resetting something up and trying to figure out making a picture, he had made this selfie and took a picture of it. And I became really interested in a way in which because all of, because all of these images made in the mirror, and again, we see this, the, the surface of the mirror and these smudges, you know, we can see that we're not looking directly at him, but we're looking at it through a sideways mirror. These are all kind of, they're made within an enclosed space like the making the looking and the positioning of them is all completed within that loop um and especially when you have this um doubling down through the in, in another type of image where my camera lens is reflected but i came really interested in these other loops that are happening this loop that's happening with him and his own image but then the ways in which these cell phone screens point to an escape from the structure that I've created and the way in which they may immediately be disseminated um, through text or chat or Instagram or another app or whatever. And that they pointed in this way, like they were to me like the, the orifice in the painting of Boo Girl's Water Girl, where it's like in that space, are you entering or leaving? So I became really interested in these like, loops within loops and then there's other images like this where you know thinking of create you know thinking about really you know we have this thing that's happening between the camera and the construction of the scene but also um this gaze that's happening that's happening between me and my friend abdi here um where the viewer to the final image can never be in between that space um and then ones like this which this one is just I always think of this as like a fun play on off of those 18th century enlightenment paintings um, of, or like the, the thing that like Michael Fried is loves of absorption or whatever, but it kind of contradicts itself. Um, these do not, these are not um, in, in the making of them, they're not accountable to a beholder, um, but the way that they're produced and the final image implicates a viewer even though the viewer can never become a part of the scene because again, it is wholly enclosed within the space of the mirror. Um, and then, you know, here, one of the things that I, 
you know, it's, I, I should have included like a close up because something else that happens in these cell phone screens is um, they, when you look at these images in real life, you can see in those screens, they reveal like much more of the setup. They have a wider angle of view than what my camera does. So in a way they, they not only point outwards, but they reveal the, the structure of my studio. And so that studio becomes like, a now it has just become its, its own sort of set. Um, it's its own kind of character that can kind of produce and reproduce itself. Um, I'm really interested in the way in which the studio is like a site of production, but also reproduction, but also in that way in which, you know, uh, uh, Lalash and Harris inspired me that like all of the, any, any elements, anything still within my reach can come back into it and be reincorporated and reproduced. Um, so that's kind of what's going on in the studio. Um, and I think I've got, the last thing is I'm start, I'm like thinking through and I don't have all the final kind of like language and stuff around this, but um, I'm starting to do some, um, you know, I don't know if I like the term historical processes, but I'm really thinking about just like where does the whole, you know, thinking like really back to this, like the language of black and white photography. Anyways, this image here, a ground, which is from my thesis show, is another one of these where the surface of this mirror is completely, a lot of the in, interesting information on it is rendered quite invisible, except, I don't know if you can see here, like this, and this the edge of this, this is like an edge of a, a reflector, the black ring of the reflector, you start to see the smudge. This is where those little ideas of like, this requirement for a material, um, a, a materiality of blackness as as requisite for for making visible a type of latent information. This is where these ideas started forming, or in an image like this, which was in my UCLA thesis, where we see. And it's funny. I th I think many maybe every photographer said that thing where you've like made a picture and you've like thought you spent enough time with it, and then like I. It wasn't until I got this back from the framer for my thesis show that I realized my fingerprints were made visible by the tripod and things. I think I had noticed this, but it was like, oh my God, there's my fingerprint. This is where these ideas started coming about. And again, like I said before, I was thinking about this way in which like of merging into and confusing the space of like, in this image, it's, it's not only a collapsing of space, I'm actually in the space in front of the image, not behind it, but also merging into and out of these, this material or thinking about what is the support and what is the structure or what is the subject and what is the support and the ways in which blackness plays in with that. Or just like if the relationship to manipulation or and to power, thinking a lot about like the ways in which Maplethorpe's images, even though he's not presently He's not present in, you know, like holding the subject of them feel that way. Um, I feel like Maplethorpe always puts the black viewer in this position, I feel like of, of collapsing into the subject and not being autonomous. So I've been thinking about all of these really things that I have not yet resolved. And again, we can return to this darker mirror picture. So I'm kind of, you know, it's, these things have been popping up a lot in various projects over the years. This is exposures. And I swear I'm like almost done here because I'm not going to go over an hour. <laughs> um, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of like working these ideas and I've been kind of coming to this idea that maybe going back to some earlier processes might be interesting. And this is where like, I still need to do more interest, more kind of like research and thinking things through. Um, this is not one of those, this is a <laughs> digital image, but I've been making, so I've started making these salt paper prints. Um, and this is the latest thing. This is a portfolio that was just published. Um, and, I am just going to put them out here. I, because I have not resolved any particular statement or, as I said, language around them. Um, 
and yeah, it's work in progress. So that's, you know, what's currently going on. But one of the things that I'm really wanting to do is to find a way to um, incorporate like a wet dark room in a studio space so that I can learn more and think through these things. I haven't, you know, I think I picked this up um, in collaboration. So I picked this up in collaboration with Barrett from F Zero um, Project there. Um, based in Glendora in the San Gabriel Valley, um, and he's like an amazing printer. But one thing I'm thinking about is is um, I I need to kind of like figure out a way in which I can do some do a lot of this myself and just totally experimenting um, because this is a process I haven't done since a, since a uh, you know quote historic processes class in undergrad twenty years ago. Um, so I. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna like end it here. Um, I'm amazed that I stayed. I did it right <laughs> for a minute before five o'clock. So Scott, should we open it up to questions? Yeah, that sounds great. Or, okay, I hope this all made sense. I'm just I, like, yeah, I'll I'll join you in the room, <laughs> and I will encourage anybody else okay. who wants to join by turning on your video. Please do. Um, this is really part of the enjoyment of, um, of being in conversation about photography. Um, I, I, I wanna start, Paul, by saying thank you. That was so remarkable, engaging, and enlightening um, about your work. Uh, I really, you know, personally, I love just the many, many layers and connections to history and the history of photography that just permeate your work. I mean, from the metaphor of mirrors and windows to the physical use of mirrors, to the tactility of your fingerprints. I mean, there are so many things that you were talking about that were just really firing a lot of thoughts and ideas um, in my head. But I don't want to be the one to talk. I want other people to talk. And I want to welcome um, anybody who has questions to uh, use the raise hand feature. That's at the bottom of your screen over toward the right under reactions. Um, it's a nice egalitarian way for us to call on you and uh, hear what your thoughts are or questions for Paul. Cool. Are you going to be checking that? Uh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. I, okay. I will. Um, so don't need you to do that. Um, you don't need to screen share, Paul, unless you prefer to. Uh, if you want to go back and refer to any images, in which case, just leave leave the, uh, the PowerPoint open. Yeah, is it helpful? Uh, it, it could be. I mean, let's see. We can always pop back in. Um, okay. Why don't we go ahead and start with uh, Mike Sakazagawa. He's got a question. Okay. Hi, thank you so much for the, the that presentation. It was really wonderful. Um, so sort of one of the things that I was thinking about, um, you, you talked a, a lot about the exchange happening between yourself and the subjects of your portraits. Um, and I think it seems clear like that that is, or at least a portion of that exchange is visible in the images. Um, but I'm wondering about how, um, like if at least part of the motivation for making these portraits is the opportunity to set up that exchange to provide a space for that exchange between yourself and these people that you describe as being important to you um, that's obviously something that interaction between you and the subject is something that's going to be very um, important to you personally as the artist and to the subject um, as someone who is is in relationship to you i'm, I'm wondering about what it does, like what the image does when you share it with other people, with the audience, um, what does it do to, like what do you imagine it does to the audience? I don't know if that's something you can answer for them, but also like what it does for you and also how it, inf and for your subjects and how it may or may not inflect that ex exchange and, and your experience of that exchange in memory. Does that question make sense? Oh yeah, I mean, so it, that's a really good question, and it's it's 
it's manifested in different ways. So at the, at the beginning, it was like, hey friends, can you sit with me? None of us know what this work is gonna look like or if these pictures are gonna be terrible or what. And so there was a, a one kind of trap, right? And so then, you know, and I didn't even know what I was doing. So I started, I realized that sharing the images, providing, making them as part of like a gift exchange was really important for just being like, it was just a thing getting started, right? But as the work starts going out into the world, things that were that I was making, like, as you said, it was exactly at its kernel. Like, since I was in high school, making photographs was like me carrying it around was like a way to start a conversation, to break through a lot of like, I was such like a shy, awkward, like, teen, you know? And it's like coming out and all of that stuff, right? So that was always a part of it. So. So that was the setup, right? It was, it was a way for like me and these friends and people that I was getting to know. I was particularly, I was asking friends who's at moments where our, the nature of our friendship was changing. I was going back and asking like people I had dated in undergrad to sit for me and be like, do we, how do we still get along? You know, it was all these types of curiosity with family. It was because my mom had moved back to the South. She had moved back to Louisiana after I grew up in, um, Southern California. And so I was starting to get to know extended family as an adult. And it was a way of being like, let me share what I'm doing. In New York, as the images started spreading through this like zine culture, the work became like a platform. And so even though the starting point for me was always like limited to just my little group of people, it became a platform where people are like, I want to be in them. I, like you start getting like, and some of the images and the people in them started becoming notorious in a certain way. So it's like, oh, okay, the work, you start then having like a, sometimes a, where, where certain desires link up and sometimes where they're just wildly mismatched. So also all of this way up until 2014, all of the portraits, a name was attached to them. I also didn't, I had also taken for granted that I was making work for the most part in New York, sometimes LA or Berlin or Mexico City or whatever, mostly New York, within a viewership that everyone was like, at no more than one degree away separated from a subject. So there was a type of familiarity or recognition at least built in. It's like the recognition I would call it as like, I think maybe I was on the dance floor with this person at 5 a.m. and like, we're all like a little, you know, but it's if it, that's what I'm talking about, like that, like uh, that kind of like uh, initial contact experience that then you kind of like negotiate seeing it somewhere else. Anyways, the names were still attached to everything. When I moved to LA, I re that was the first time, and just like having to present my work in the context of a critique. Suddenly, there was a whole group of a room of people who were like, "Who are these people? I don't care who they are, and why am I looking at them?" Except. Someone was like, oh, I recognize that art. That's Kate Hardy. Like, is this just some like photographs of other well-known artists? Like event, like it was, I had one of those critiques. And so I had to really think about like, what is the relationship between the viewer and the subject of the work? Even if at the point it's always my own kind of like drive at its thing, like what do they become to, and this is when thinking about how this, how a subject becomes a portrait, becomes a model, becomes something else. And so now there's still this current of portraits that are happening. And I'm quite often making portraits for friends that go in another way, but because for the most part in the context of exhibition, portraits don't circulate that way anymore. Maybe because I'm not making the type of portrait that, I don't know, I don't know necessarily why, I've left it to what I want the viewer to get is a sense of the structural aspect of the relationship between the subjects, me and the person, but also horizontally or laterally between all of the various images, that there's something there, but I don't tell the story. But there are people, so like if you are, if you find yourself within that like one or two degree relation to a subject, either identified by a recognizable silhouette or a tattoo or something like that, you can start to piece together a story. And so there's always, I'm organizing exhibitions based on people recognizing or having an entryway into a certain social aspect, 
but formally I'm just interested in like a viewer if they're just coming with like like interesting composition something is going on here it's a little gay it's a little sexual but but within the scheme of things those point to I think underlying aspects of just like how photographs themselves are a, a technology that is a result of a productive kind of desire. I hope I answered that. That was a lot of stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that was great. Um, there's a comment uh, from social, uh, excuse me, from Sonia Nauman uh, that I'll go ahead and read. It says, I appreciate your process and the way you intuitively move through it. I'm curious as to how much of an impact the individual aspects of your subjects influence how you make the image. Is it more so about you or more so about their own intrinsic nature? And what do you explore in the room together? Does your vision shift when the space is shared or do you have your vision stick to it? Um, I don't really ever have like portraits planned ahead. I mean, let me see. I wonder if it's helpful. I'm going to go back to my shared screen, but I'm going to, because I just want to, I think it might be helpful if, if we go back and look at a few different things. So, you know, like if we talk about images like these, none of these were planned. Like, you know, for this, I was, it was like a studio visit when <laughs> the friend asked how I did, how I made one. And I was like, I'll demonstrate. And then it was like, okay, we're in it. And this one, I had made a plan to go make a portrait of a friend. And then he was like, I have another friend here. Let's make it three people. And, you know, and then <laughs> there's three people. You know, these ones, the only construct is, okay, we both have cameras and there's, the, all of the elements of let's say the ways and the, the compositions or whatever are just found through doing the act rather than having like an, an idea of an image you know existing prior but you know even you know so in, in one sense i say these pictures the the way in which things are happening is always just on how to make a picture and literally like Vish is supporting my arm so I can steady the camera to make the picture. It's not like we're like, let's do this thing and then we're just going to pose at it. Um, but when you go back to, um, you know, let's say these, where were those early portraits? Like images like these, I think in a certain sense they correspond to the person. Like, I think having just like conversations and knowing people is just really important because then um i just take the lead i'm like we could make a portrait this way this way or this way sometimes like i had no idea that christopher would have these like this amazing tear in his socks um he's like i'll bring a few things and brought this like lovely skirt and stuff like that and it just became this picture that i couldn't plan you know sometimes like zane here he had some specific clothes that he wanted to wear Everything just kind of, I think, um, plays off of the ways in which we know each other and are comfortable with each other. Um, yeah, but I don't believe that pictures are like contain an essence of someone. Um, something I've realized over the years is I've made a portrait of someone and then their relationship to their own identity or what, you know, in various ways may change and what authority does my portrait have over a dynamic subject yeah that was great thank you for the response uh there's also a question from christopher christopher do you want to unmute or turn on your video or whatever you prefer hey paul we're big fans of your work uh, just a quick question about uh, environment, just to speak more to your relationship with your subjects. Um, mm -hmm. Does music play a role in your art or your process in any way? And also, mm -hmm. I find with friends or people that I know, having a third person in the room, that being the camera, uh, mm -hmm. can change energy. 
So like, how do you have them forget it? Or do you use that energy actually to capture your images? Oh, yeah. The, <clears throat> yeah, the cam I'm, I'm glad you said that. The camera's always the third person in the room, or the fourth, <laughs> or the fifth, or whatever. So in the image so now there's always like kind of a fun of like the handoff of the camera like i'll make the setup and sometimes i will you know the handoff of the shutter or something might happen or you know a friend will bring their own camera and then but having opening it up to to um inviting that type of like agency and like interaction is really helpful you know with the earlier images, it was totally different because I think, and that's what I was talking about, like it was a different type of trust because it was like, I was this authority, even though I was just like some like 23 year old, you know, and like not knowing what I was doing. Like when you're behind the camera and a tripod in front of someone else, it's a very sort of like nerve wracking thing. So this, it, I was making them in my kitchen. I would just take stuff down off the wall and then I moved to making them in my bedroom so I could be a better roommate and not leaving stuff you know, up all the time. The thing that I didn't realize, this is part of also the, what became kind of like, oh, like how come I didn't think about this before I left New York and came to LA was, I knew that I didn't want to be making pictures in a studio. Like, you know, I would do like, photo assisting jobs and I had access to like getting a discount rate for like a daylight studio or whatever. And I was always like, nah, but I didn't realize that making the portraits in with the friends in the same space where like two nights before we may have been like having beers and like listening to music, how, how not coming into like a totally different environment. And then um, for me, I've always stuck with like, for years, I only shot everything with one camera, what my Mamiya RZ, with my, um, I think I had a 180 lens. That was it. Like fumbling with things, changing stuff around just makes people nervous. So it was just like, here's the thing. I know what I'm doing. I have a basic construct, make people comfortable. Um, so that's the environment. And then music, it's just like whatever, like some like Spotify or something like that is totally fine. There's years ago, my when I was at the Studio Museum residency, my friend Ryan um, shared with me his journal entries, and he writes about like as like a couple times coming up and visiting me and us making pictures. And at one point, he talks about like he's like, oh, as I like took my boots off, the same Beyonce was playing that was you know we're listening to the same Beyonce track that we were listening to like the weekend before, you know, and everyone's hanging out and it's. I think it's yeah. It just go. It just flows. I hope. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. I'm. Uh, there's there's more questions coming in, Paul. I don't know how much more time you're able to uh, to share on these. I have nothing else to do except well eat dinner later. Okay. Great. Um. Yeah. So. This is a great question. It's actually two questions uh, from Michael Seleski. He says, hey, Paul, two questions. Um, one, do you feel like the nature of your work will change due to the pandemic, like the closeness of bodies? And then two, uh, I am a young photographer seeking out advice about pursuing an MFA. What are your thoughts on furthering education? Do you feel it's necessary for photographers? Um, okay, I'll do this. I'll do the second question and then remind me of the first. So, I mean, if you feel like it's right, it's the right time, then I think it's the right time to pursue the MFA. Like, I don't think there's any one way to do it. I waited 10 years. I mean, when I finished undergrad, I didn't even know what an MFA was. And I was really confused by people, like some friends. I remember like my friend, Sam Contis, like she went to Yale, like, a year she applied for you like a year after you finished undergrad i was like we just studied photography why are you doing like but it made sense for her you know and um it it really like helped her solidify like these core ideas in her work um that have like propelled her to, this, to the most amazing things right now i had no idea what i was doing and so i just worked day jobs and made photos um at night and on weekends and i did things by myself sort of like in self-directed ways 
and just being persistent until I realized I had I could no longer do it myself. I needed like the questions I had, the type of mentorship or support I had, like or that I needed, I did not have. It was like this is the time to go. Um, so I so I guess what I'm trying to say is like when you know you have when you know the kinds of questions you 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 have and like um, then it's the time to go. 